Good afternoon. I'm Simbri Ross, the Grants Program Manager for the Nonprofit Security Grant Program, along with Charles Madden, my Supervisor and Grants Bureau Chief. Welcome to HCMA's Nonprofit Security Grant Program Question and Answer. Today we're going to review how to submit your application for this 2021 NSGP application. Please make sure that you have material for uh, today's webinar and agenda, investment justification, scoring worksheet, AEL code, and fact sheet. Today our topics will begin with an NSGP overview, an application process timeline review, an application requirements review, the summary of allowable costs, review of core capabilities and questions. You'll find that agenda also on the first page of your slide presentation. Regarding the nonprofit security grant program for this year, as many of you are already familiar, NSGP is for the purpose of funding support for target hardening activities for nonprofit organizations that are at high risk of terrorist attack that are located within designated urban areas. This year, the program is offering $90 million for nonprofits in designated urban areas. $180 million will be available nationwide, which is up considerably from the amount available last year for the nation of a total of $90 million. Charles will describe in more detail some application changes for this year in terms of funding amount per subaward. Thank you, Sembri. Uh, my name is Charles Madden. I'm the Grants Bureau Chief for DC HSEMA. Uh, a couple of updates and changes from previous years for the nonprofit security grant. Uh, this year, uh, due to the increase in funding, the uh, maximum total uh, for a single application has gone up to $150,000. Uh, applicants are not required to apply for that much. You can apply for the right amount that fits your project, uh, but the total cap is up to $150,000. Uh, the period of performance for this program is 36 months starting on September 1st, 2021. Uh, we encourage uh, applicants to try to end uh, with before then, but uh, there is a potential of up to 36 months uh, of period available. Uh, again, starting September 1st, 2021. No project costs before September 1st, 2021 could be eligible under this program. Uh, this year, also, FEMA has done a good job of clarifying uh, how applicants with multiple physical locations, multiple facilities or sites uh, can apply. Uh, an applicant with a single site can clearly apply for one uh, application, but if an applicant had multiple sites, either in different facilities across the region, um, or multiple campuses within uh, a, a certain geographic area, uh, if you can apply for up to three uh, separate sites. That would make, make for a total of three uh, applications, each at $150,000 maximum, with a total overall uh, cap of $450,000. Uh, for each site, if you're going to apply for multiple sites, you must submit one complete investment justification for each site. So you would not be able to combine three separate sites into one application. You would have to submit three separate applications, one for each site. Uh, and each uh, individual application would not only have to have its own investment justification, it would also have to have the other required documents that we will go over later, uh, the mission statement and vulnerability assessment for each individual site. Now that only applies for applications for multiple sites. Uh, if you're only applying for one site, you'd be submitting one application. So as the next slide indicates, in terms of the application process timeline, the Notice of Funding announcement, the Notice of Funding Opportunity was released on February the 25th. Applications will be due to our office, HCMA, on the 23rd of April. With our reviewing and scoring all applications for the region and submitting an application on behalf of the National Capital Region to FEMA on May the 14th. As uh, the slide indicates, we expect FEMA selections by the latter part of July, with subawards being issued to recipients in this region by September 30th. Although this is a three-year grant, your initial period of performance will be for two years from September the 1st, 2021 to September the 30th, 2023. The application requirements as uh, shown on the next slide 
slide consists of basically three things. An investment justification, which is an Excel template. You must provide the year of facility construction. You must indicate whether you are a 501c3 organization. You must provide a DUNS number. But you'll also provide two separate documents, a mission statement and a risk vulnerability assessment. On the next page, mission statement. There's no format per se for what a mission statement should be, but ideally it should be on your letterhead and say who, what, and why you exist. What is your calling? What is your purpose as an organization? Similarly, a vulnerability assessment, there are no guidelines by FEMA regarding how they should be completed or by whom. But the vulnerability assessment is the foundation upon which your application is based. It addresses the threats and vulnerability of your location or your facility. Equipment or other activities requested in the application should directly link to the threats and vulnerabilities identified in the assessment. Again, there is no official format for vulnerability assessment, however. FEMA does encourage those within your facility or within your, your sphere who have a law enforcement background, they might be ideal folks to complete such a vulnerability assessment for your organization. And just to uh, cover, reiterate on those two items, uh, these two items are not going to be submitted to FEMA. The only thing that gets, that we will submit to FEMA is your investment justification. However, we as the state are required to certify to FEMA that we did receive the investment justification and the mission statement and the vulnerability assessment from the applicant. Uh, so we need to have those three items to consider your application to be complete. We will then retain those, uh, those items for reference and the investment justification will be the portion of your application that we will then submit to FEMA. As the next slide shows, the primary document your application will be really communicated through is the investment justification that consists of seven parts your applicant information, background, your risk, which is actually a three-part section, threat, vulnerability, and consequence, the fourth section, target hardening, the fifth, milestones, the sixth, project management, and the seventh, impact. Regarding section six, or section four, target hardening, we want to make sure that you are aware of allowable costs, equipment, you have been provided with the AEL code, which features category 14 and 15 equipment, but we will go through this in more detail. Contract and security personnel, training related costs, planning related costs, exercise related costs, and construction. The next slide, allowable cost equipment, Charles. Yes, uh, FEMA has actually done a, a good job of improving how they describe uh, allowable costs this year. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, these basic allowable costs have stayed very uh, consistent uh, from year to year. Uh, the way FEMA has described allowable costs for equipment, and this is the majority of what most applicants will be uh, purchasing, uh, is security-related equipment to be used or installed. Uh, the equipment should match up to allowable costs that are listed in FEMA's authorized equipment list, or the AEL, in categories 14 and 15. Uh, the, if you were to just Google or uh, follow the link for FEMA AEL, it's the, the first hit you'll get. Uh, it is a rather complicated, lengthy list of, uh, of items, but fortunately, only categories 14 and 15 are the ones that we would be looking at for the um, application. I believe we can have a redacted uh, eight version of the AEL that we can post to the, our website as well uh, that you can use as a reference. Um, and this is for, in your application, you'd be referring to the AEL number that corresponds to this type of equipment, which will help everybody, if you know, especially confirm the items in your application for equipment are eligible. Uh, the types of equipment in categories 14 and 15 are physical security enhancement equipment and inspection and screening systems. And below on the slide are examples of the kinds of things that are in those categories, uh, lighting, doors, uh, detection systems, surveillance cameras, access control equipment such as like turnstiles or methods of uh, uh, determining uh, badging or, or determining which kind of people are in your facility, uh, physical perimeter security like fencing, walls, and jersey barriers, 
uh, screening and inspection equipment, uh, and also uh, to some extent uh, backup computer systems, basically to recover from uh, data from uh, damage or, or a cyber attack or a physical attack. Uh, also, FEMA has clarified uh, new this year that there are a couple of other elements of equipment that are not in categories 14 and 15, but they really want to reiterate it's only these two things that are outside of category 14 and 15 that would be eligible, and that is handheld radios and public warning systems. I've indicated at the bottom of the, uh, uh, the slide here what those AEL numbers are and how they're described in the authorized equipment. So if you were to add radios or public warning systems into your application, you would want to use that AEL number and describe it with those terms, the uh, public address system, for instance. As the next slide indicates, also planning is an allowable cost. Planning consisting of security or emergency planning expenses and the materials to conduct planning activities. They must be related to the protection of the facility and the people within. Examples of allowable planning include development and enhancement of security plans, emergency contingency or continuity of operation plans, evacuation shelter in place plans and security or risk management plans, and emergency response plans. The next slide also indicates the training and exercises that are also allowable under the nonprofit security grant program. Please note that this is limited to the organization's personnel, staff, members, and volunteers. It does not pertain to training and exercises for the community. So off-site and on-site security training is allowed. Train the trainer courses are allowed. Allowable training-related costs are limited to attendance fees and related expenses such as materials and supplies. However, travel is not a reimbursable cost. Allowable training and exercise topics include physical and cyber security, target hardening and terrorism awareness, emergency preparedness topics such as CERT training, active shooter training, and emergency first aid training. And in your application, if you are going to be including training, um, please include uh, some details about the nature of the training and who the training is for, things like the, uh, the, the type of training, the uh, topic, participants, the length of the course, what vulnerability the activity will help mitigate. What we've noticed is that if you just include training as a line item in the budget and don't say anything more about it, uh, FEMA won't, uh, either won't approve it or will ask questions and there will be a hold up in the release of funds. Other costs include, as reflected in our next slide, contracted security personnel. This is limited to contracted security and not employees of the organization. Funds may not be used to purchase equipment for contracted security. And the application should justify proposed contracted security personnel costs and should provide the number of personnel, the frequency of use, and the hourly rate. A note on contracted security personnel, uh, if you do include contracted security personnel in your application, uh, please uh, identify, keep in mind that if it's more than 50% of your entire application, we will probably have to ask FEMA to give a waiver uh, to that award. Uh, there is a, a law in the books that limits the use of Homeland Security grant funds to pay for uh, what they call personnel uh, to no more than 50%. Uh, it's not ineligible to go over 50%, but if you do have an application that's over 50% for contracted security personnel, we will have to get a waiver from FEMA, so just keep that in mind. The next category of allowable costs are management and administration. Up to 5% of the sub-recipient's sub-award may be used for what we term as M&A. So that's no more than $7,500 for a $150,000 award. Now these funds, M&A, is not an operational cost or project management cost. It is related to managing the grant award. So an example of M&A would be grant reporting, financial management, correspondence and monitoring, and include in section four of your investment justification fully what activities you consider to be M&A. So again, grant reporting would be completing things like a project management plan or a quarterly status reports. Financial management would be submitting reimbursement requests and correspondence and monitoring. If you were to have a monitoring visit with, from our agency 
or whatever you would do to converse with us regarding issues that arise regarding your project's uh, furtherance. These would be examples of M&A. M&A cannot be $40,000. M&A can only be no more than 5% of your subaward amount. Uh, the other uh, type of cost we wanted to cover as an eligible cost, and just note a couple of points about it, is indirect. Uh, indirect is an el costs are eligible under the Nonprofit Security Grant Program. Uh, if you're an organization that currently has a federally approved indirect cost rate, you may use that rate. Uh, you should note the source of the approved rate when you put it in the budget. So if you have, for instance, an um, indirect cost rate approved by the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, when you're putting it in your budget, you'd want to represent it in your budget and then say it's you know, XYZ percent rate approved by the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, if you do not have an indirect cost rate that's uh, approved by a federally, uh, federal agency, you are allowed uh, under uh, the 2 CFR 200, uh, that's the federal uh, regulations regarding grant uh, management, uh, you can rely on the de minimis rate that's authorized under 2 CFR 200, and that is 10%. If you are going to use that, you should indicate that that is the rate you're going to use and the source of it. So you would indicate we are going to use the de minimis indirect cost rate authorized under 10% authorized under 2 CFR 200. Um, for both M&A and indirect, if you're going to include those in your budgets, please make sure that they show up in the budget that's in Section 4. We're going to go through the investment justification template itself in just a couple of minutes here in great detail, and we'll highlight again in that section that where you should put it. I just want to make sure that if you're going to include those, put it in your budget up front rather than trying to work it in after the award has already been issued because that's kind of a change of scope and budget that uh, can cause some complications. Uh, so anyway. That's just M&A and indirect, uh, and we can answer questions about those uh, uh, later on. In our next slide, you see a list of unallowable costs. Organizational operating costs, hiring public safety personnel, general use expenditures, overtime, license place readers, facial recognition software, knox boxes, guns, weapons, landscaping, and landscaping does not mean large boulders that serve as barriers or walls or as a type of fencing, but landscaping as perennial flowers and things along that line and trees. Uh, initiatives that benefit a federal agency or property, initiatives that study technology development, proof of concept initiatives, pre-award costs including grant writer fees. So if you were to write this investment justification and try to get reimbursed for that amount, or cost, that is an unallowable cost to submit to us for reimbursement. Development of the investment justification, the development of vulnerability assessment, sexual predator screening database, and weapons training are all unallowable costs. In section seven, the next slide, for impact, you will be asked to indicate what core capabilities your project encompasses. There are 34 are 32 core capabilities that are uh, readable in detail when you press on the link indicated here in the slide. But more frequently than not, the purchases for these projects are normally four core capabilities, access control and identity verification, cybersecurity, physical protective measures, and screening search and detection. And we will cover this again uh, when we get into the investment justification template itself. Uh, we'll re reiterate when we get to this section, section seven, uh, the best practice for answering that question. We do not expect you as the applicant to be experts in FEMA's core capabilities and how they're defined and their scope and breadth. Uh, we're just suggesting uh, that you would refer to one of these, one or more of these four, as these are most likely the core capabilities that your project will support. Uh, so don't worry about not being an expert in the core capabilities or the FEMA's uh, language. We'll address this again in the section seven of the investment justification. And at this time, we are going to go to an investment justification so that you can get a sense of how to complete the various boxes, first starting with the instructions. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you don't have a copy of this Excel document, uh, please uh, go get it off of uh, the HCMA website, uh, or we can also re resend out to you as well. Uh, this is the document you definitely need to have. Uh, it's an Excel template that FEMA provides that all applicants have to submit their, invest their applications in. Uh, the, the 
the Excel template has two uh, tabs that you can see at the bottom. We're on the first tab, the introduction. This basically is just some introductory information. It can provide some instruction on how to use the, t the, the template. A couple of things I do want to point out, they do indicate in the instructions the naming convention that you should use when you're submitting your, uh, your Excel template to us. Uh, and for this one, it's FY21, NSGP, UA for urban area, uh, because that's the urban area application. Uh, then put in the state abbreviation, that'd be DC. Then put in the urban area, and for us, the national capital region, that's NCR. And then your name. Uh, that way, we, if we get 75 applications and they just say investment justification, but don't say which applicant it's from, it's really hard to figure out how to organize all that. So please follow that naming convention when you submit your uh, files. I would also say on your mission statement and your vulnerability assessment, uh, you would do something similar. Name it like your organization's name and then mission statement or vulnerability assessment, just so we know what the file is before we open it. Also, and this is a really key note here, in the next paragraph you can see they do ask that you save it in the Excel 97 to 2003 format before submitting. This is the way FEMA wants it. I wish they didn't do this. Uh, there is instructions on how to take a modern version of Excel and save it backwards into version 97 to 2003. It's in the instructions on this tab. So please make sure you do that before you submit it um, because that'll really make it a lot easier and make it sure it's compliant with FEMA's requirements. Uh, further down in the instructions, there's some helpful hints um, about how to move through it, uh, how to copy and paste. Um, it is a locked template, so you will, you may have to use keyboard commands to uh, to copy paste. Using either if you're on a, uh, a Microsoft or a PC, using Control C to copy and Control V to paste. Um, the, it is, a, it is a, because it's locked, it is a, bit of a finicky document. And unfortunately, we can't provide tech support to it because we, we can't unlock it. Uh, so please refer to the helpful hints. Uh, if you really are having trouble, uh, you can contact us and we can hopefully uh, explain what may be going wrong for you. Um, also, you'll note because it's locked, spell check and character count uh, will, features won't be available to you. For both of these reasons, uh, I do find it to be very helpful to maybe look at the question and write your answer in another document, uh, a Word document or some kind of more friendly uh, you know, word processor a document, just so you can do your word counts, do your spell check, do your editing there, and then copy it into the, into the template or just write, rewrite it in the template, just because this Excel template is fairly unfriendly. Uh, so I would encourage most people to do their creative writing outside of it and then make your last step putting it into the template itself. Final note on the template and technical issues, if you're using a Mac, it's very likely you can break this template uh, or that it won't work for you. Uh, if you're using a, a tablet or a mobile device, sometimes they don't handle it very well. The best way to approach it is to use a standard PC desk computer. Uh, that seems to be the one that works the best. Um, and again, I, I know a lot of people use Macs or um, mm -hmm. uh, iPad temp tablets. Those th seem to break this uh, template. So if that's your primary function, uh, I would suggest trying to find a workaround, get somebody, a member of your community, uh, friend, neighbor, coworker who has a PC to do the final uh, entry into this, this template. Otherwise, you may run into some problems. Test the template early. I can't say that strongly enough. Please test the template early so you can find any technical problems first uh, and then figure out how to fix it. So now we're going to go to the very first page of the template or the application, and you should see one Roman numeral starting with the words nonprofit organization applicant information. In the very first box, you're going to complete your legal name of your organization. What name do you do business as? Your legal name. And please make sure this is the same as the name of the, the organization name you put in the file name. If the file name says one thing and then your, the name you put in this box says something else, it'll cause a lot of confusion. Okay. And also in the next box, the physical full address of your facility. Include your city, your state, and your zip code. If you are in a county 
The following box should indicate a county. Clearly for the District of Columbia, that would not be applicable, but if you're in Maryland or Virginia, which are part of the National Capital Region, indicate the appropriate county. The following box, the year of original facility construction. We want the specific year, not an approximation, not that the building is 50 years old or 100 years old. If the building is 150 years old and was built in 1870, please write the actual year of construction, 1870. The next box, organization type, a short description of your organization's ideology, beliefs, and mission. This is limited to 400 characters. So please note that even though you're addressing your mission in this box, this is not your mission statement. You will still be required to submit a separate mission statement of whatever format to submit as an entire application to have all three documents, but this does not satisfy the mission statement requirement, but it must be completed as part of this investment justification. Thereafter, you'll indicate the membership and community served. What demographically does your congregation, your mosque, your church consist of? Who is your community? Who do you serve? Thereafter, 501c3 tax exempt designation. There's a drop down menu, yes or no, we're not asking for a number. But for Dun and Brad Street, we do want precisely your Dun and Brad Street number. If you have any questions about it, consult the email that we sent you. There's a phone number where you can confirm your Dun and Brad Street information. The urban area for this sub award is the National Capital Region. Again, available from a drop down menu. Your funding request how much are you seeking as a grant? $150,000 or $100,000, whatever your award is that you seek. The project total. My personal preference is that it really shouldn't exceed the um, grant total that you're seeking, but I have seen an inconsistency where people could say their project is a $500,000 project, but they're seeking a grant of $150,000. Charles, do you have a preference? Yeah, it, it does seem like a duplicative question, but it's only there to uh, for those organizations if your, the overall security project that you're implementing is a much larger project that is greater than $150,000 and you're only seeking NSGP funding from FEMA to cover up to $150,000, that's where you might say, my funding request is $150,000, my total project is $500,000. If that is the case, however, this is the only place where you'd refer to the larger project. In the budget and the rest of the narrative, only add up to your funding request. Uh, we've seen in sometimes the larger project is represented in the target hardening activity mm -hmm. budget, and that just really confuses FEMA. So. Uh, if it is a larger project, you can indicate it here, but that's the only place you'd refer to the larger project. And with regard to the question about a current contract with DHS, that is exactly what it means. Are you providing any contractual services for the Department of Homeland Security? A grant would not constitute a contract. So if your contact with DHS is some other type of grant, then your answer to this question is no. But if you are serving in some type of uh, service capacity for or on behalf of DHS, then you would indicate yes. And then you would describe in the box thereafter exactly what is the nature of the service that you provide to the Department of Homeland Security. With regard to phase, new or ongoing, ongoing would be applicable if you've had prior nonprofit security grants. So if you had a grant, even I would think as far back as 2015, 16, or 17, or 20, then this could possibly be an ongoing investment phase. However, if you've never received a nonprofit grant in the past, then the phase selected from the drop-down menu would be new. Okay. And just to reiterate that whole first section, uh, it should be completed. It is not scored, so it doesn't contribute to the score of the application, but it should be complete. Now, just so that also you have an overview, you should have a scoring worksheet so you get a sense of each section what is available in terms of points? This is a 40-point application. And normally, as a preference for every section, you'll see the number of points available. So for instance,
For background, you'll see that two points are available if you complete both boxes. In the first box, you have to describe the symbolic value of your site as a highly recognized national or historic institution or significant institution uh, within the community. So, for instance, if you are known to be a church that was founded um, uh, after the Civil War, a historically black church with a long civil rights history, that is the kind of thing that would constitute symbolic value. And in the next box, describe any previous or existing role in responding to or recovering from terrorist attacks. Again, if you provide a place of shelter if there is an event, or if you provide a kitchen, a soup kitchen, for people who are displaced, those are the type of activities we would want you to describe in the second box. And if both boxes are completed, the maximum you would get for these two boxes is two points out of a 40-point application. So I think we'll move on to the next section, which is section three, risk. Uh, and this is a uh, very valuable section. Uh, you can see it's 12 possible points out of the entire score of 40. There are three sections to risk. This uh, is how FEMA basically describes and defines how they view risk. Uh, there's threat, there's vulnerability, and there's consequence. Uh, and the, in this application, each of those sections is scored uh, at uh, three, uh, four points apiece for a total of 12. Uh, the biggest advice I would give you in this section is to not mix and match and make sure you're answering the right question in the right section. So in threat, answer the questions about threat. In vulnerability, answer vulnerability. And in consequence, talk about the consequences of an attack. Uh, if you address threat in the vulnerability section, it really won't contribute to the score and you're just losing points you could have otherwise had. Uh, threat is basically what is uh, any, what's your view of why you are it being threatened? What kind of attacks do you foresee coming your direction? Or do you have any history of uh, attacks or uh, threats to your organization or organizations of your kind? Uh, that's where you would describe why you believe you're, at, you're being threatened. Uh, there's been a number of high profile incidents, sadly, throughout this country in recent years that could show, be examples of the kinds of threats that you're looking at. Uh, of course, if you have anything more specific to your organization or to organizations that are like yours, those would uh, strengthen uh, your threat narrative. Let me just say, for instance, um, when we had the attacks on mosques in New Zealand, even though that's an international incident, if you're a mosque in D.C., because you share that in common, that could be cited as a basis for a threat. Uh, Mother Emanuel? The church in South Carolina, an African-American historically black church, again, that can be a basis for a threat. Tree of Life Synagogue, if you are similar to that type of institution, institution, even though they're not in this geographic area and might not even be in this country, that is a similarity that can serve as a basis for your having a legitimate threat. So please do not rule out such parallels. Okay. Uh and the next section is vulnerability. Now, vulnerability is not the same as threat. Threat is what's coming at you. Vulnerability is why your facility is vulnerable to those kinds of threats. Uh, so once you've described what your threat picture is, then get into what makes your facility vulnerable. Uh, do you not have cameras on the front doors? Uh, do you not have uh, uh, good uh, updated uh, electronic locking systems? Uh, are your windows easily broken and, and, and without alarms? Those, that's the, what should go into the vulnerability section. If the threat occurs, what makes your facility vulnerable? And that's where you would hopefully be pulling in information from your, your vulnerability assessment of your facility, explaining what your facility's vulnerabilities are. The last section is sometimes one of the harder ones to deal with in this risk uh, uh, section, which is consequence. Uh, if the threat occurs, if you are vulnerable and therefore that threat is successful, what is the consequence of that uh, event occurring? Is it loss of life? Is it loss of your facility's ability to conduct your business? What's the impact on the community uh, if uh, an attack occurs at your facility? Uh, that's what is really the, uh, the core of the consequence section. Uh, if something happens, 
what, what's the result of that, uh, that event occurring in your facility. And you might also even consider things such as the psychological effect on your congregants or you, people in your community. Um, if there are services that you provide such as schools or daycare or things along that line for the elderly and those services are interrupted, again, that's something that should be noted. And we have seen in the past when you're located near a thoroughfare, if your facility were in some way, um, if there were a target that it resulted in even a bombing or an explosion, how that could interact with travel or impede uh, traffic if you were close to a major highway or road. So again, consider consequences as broadly as you possibly can. The next section is target hardening. Uh, and target hardening is the most important section. As you can see, it's worth 14 total points. No other section is worth this much. Um, there are two sections in the target hardening uh, uh, section. There's a narrative, and that's that open box where you have a 2200 character max uh, to type out in a uh, you know, longhand format what your project is. This is where you describe what you're going to do. Uh, we don't necessarily need, this isn't the place to describe why you're doing this project. You would have addressed that in your uh, vulnerability uh, section earlier. Uh, target hardening is your project, and this is really the only place you have to describe what you intend to do with the fund, so this is a, a good place to focus on. Uh, this is where you would lay out uh, what types of equipment you're going to purchase and where it's going to be installed. Uh, what types of training or exercises relating to security you are planning on doing, and who it's for, and what and why, and uh, what the outcome of that training would be. Uh, if you're doing a, a, a security plan, this is where you just say, "This is the plan we're doing. This is why we're doing it, and this is uh, what we're hoping to achieve from this plan." So, if we can go into a little bit more detail about the 14 points that are available here. So, first of all, we're going to look to see how well does your project mitigate risk or identify vulnerabilities, that's worth four points. The next would be how well does your project focus on prevention or protection against the risk of a terrorist attack, another four points. We're going to be also assessing whether your project is allowable for three points and whether it's feasible. So again, consider making sure when completing this section that you're using the proper AEL codes, 14 and 15 in particular for equipment, as well as whether the project is feasible. This is not the time to talk about constructing a new ingress and egress. Um, uh, the feasibility of being able to do that with $150,000 is not very likely. And also there's questions about possible allowability in terms of more FEMA review. But what is it that your project consists of? Is it feasible? Are you using the proper AEL codes? Because if you select cameras, for instance, but you use the wrong AEL code, you're going to undercut your application and devalue your application. All right. So the, uh, the first portion of the target hardening section, as, I, as we talked about earlier, is it's open field to write in text what you're going to do. So in that section, if you were, for instance, going to be doing a fence project, You'd write uh, like fencing 240 feet of eight foot chain link fence topped with one foot of barbed wire to address the vulnerabilities of breaching along the west side of the facility. That would be a nice, concise little statement of what you're planning on doing. Uh, and then you might even also indicate what your basis for your cost calculation is. For instance, 240 feet times $208 per foot equals $50,000. That's what the kind, the kind of detail you'd be putting into the narrative section. Uh, not just what you're doing, but also a little bit about which vulnerability it, it's intended to address. Then in the second section, further down the table, this is where you would just lay out the budget. Uh, and so for that one, you put in the, uh, the AEL. An example is shown at the top of uh, a sensor alarm system. Uh, it might have been described in more detail in the narrative, but down here you would just put in the AEL number, if there is one, the description of the item to be purchased, the vulnerability to be addressed, and the dollar amount. Uh, and this just makes it easy for FEMA to add up uh, what your budget uh, is based on. Uh, please make sure that the narrative matches the table and that the narrative and the table both match 
the total dollar amount that you requested on the, on the first page. And we do note that for things such as contractor security personnel, planning, training, exercise, M&A, and indirect rate, there will not be an, an AEL code. So that first column under AEL will be blank, but under your description, you can write the word planning in more specificity. You could say shelter in place planning or um, active shooter training or uh, whatever type of exercise you're uh, proposing and M&A. But we understand and do not expect you to come up with an AEL code for that type of activity. Again, contracted security personnel, planning, training, exercises, M&A, and indirect rate. No AEL code, just a descriptor under the description of an item for that type of activity. And again, this total section is worth 14 points. For the next section, milestones. Milestones are basically what are those things that you need to do to accomplish your project. So basically for equipment, a milestone, what is every step that must be taken for that equipment to be installed and purchased? Typically, you will select a vendor, that would be the first milestone. Secondly, you will purchase equipment. Third, you will install the equipment. Fourth, you'll train on the equipment. And you will have realistic start and end dates sometime after September 30th, 2021, a start date and a completion date for each milestone for each deliverable or activity that you're engaging in. This section is four out of 40 points. The next section. Just before we move on, I just wanted to point out, um, this is a place where we might want to look at the period of performance that we described earlier. Uh, we wouldn't expect there to be any milestones before uh, September 1st of 2021 because that's the beginning of the period of performance. Uh, you may also want to consider uh, some realistic startup time uh, for getting uh, your team put together, uh, getting you know, contracts in place, uh, initiating procurement, finalizing your plans. I would be a little bit dubious that uh, most applicants be ready to hit the ground running on September 1st, so you might want to put your first uh, milestone due to completion date sometime out into the first quarter of the award. Also, and we will get into this in much greater detail with uh, successful applicants as we get you set up and trained, uh, most uh, of your projects, especially the ones that are including equipment that will be installed, will require uh, an environmental and historic preservation review by FEMA. That can be a fairly lengthy process depending on if you're in a historic property. Uh, so I would suggest suggest that as a starting assumption, you probably aren't going to be installing any equipment in the first quarter of the, of the grant for sure, because that will easily be taken up uh, in FEMA's environmental and historic preservation review process, and that's if you're, you have all your ducks in a row and are you know, getting everything in early. Uh, so maybe give yourself a little bit of uh, start time uh, before setting out those first due dates for your completion of your milestones. That might be, uh, at least from my perspective, would be uh, a realistic time frame. Okay, and then uh, sixth section, project management. For three points, you'll be describing who will be your project management team for this uh, subaward. Who are the people in your church, your synagogue, your congregation who are going to make sure that this uh, project is successfully completed? Uh, you should indicate not only their names, but their phone numbers, their emails, email addresses, and experience. This person has worked on 10 prior grants with a variety of agencies and had experience with Homeland Security in this county, that state, this location. That's the kind of thing we're going to look for. We want to know how well do you justify the effectiveness of the proposed management team, the roles, the responsibility, and the governance. Uh, and in the next box, describe the project management. Describe any challenges to effective pro implementation of the project. So you might also note in completion of both sections, again, any prior work you've had with emergency management agencies or any action you've had, even with uh, law enforcement. So this is for a total of three points. How effective is this team going to be in completing uh, project management plans, quarterly status reports, submitting reimbursements, 
selecting equipment, having equipment installed, and effectively, fully, and successfully having uh, the project completed within the time period of the initial two-year period of performance. And in the next section, we're going to deal with impact, five out of 40 points. What are the measurable outputs and outcomes that will indicate that this investment justification at the end of the period of performance was successful? So for a total of four points, the focus for our agency is how well did you describe the outcomes, the outputs that would indicate that the project is successful? Yes, uh, so impact is uh, basically the so what moment. Uh, you've described your threat, your vulnerability, the consequences uh, of those threats and vulnerabilities. You've laid out your proposed project, uh, just ex explaining what you intend to do about those vulnerabilities. Uh, and then this is where you can kind of bring it all home with a, this is the impact, this is the result of us being successful in receiving this, this funding and implementing this project. Here's how our community, our facility will be safer uh, and the, the, you know, that's, that's, I think, the, uh, a good thing, way to approach this section uh, is what's, what's the result of this project when it's all said and done. So if we say that we want to install a 10-foot high fence with razor wire at the top, then one measurable outcome was or might be we will not have any intruders onto the property or into our facility. It might be that simple. We have placed bollards in our driveway, and as a result, no unauthorized uh, vehicular traffic is able to proceed into our property or on our driveway or in our facility. So the measurable outcome should show that we are able to show that this equipment is able to stop or thwart this type of attack or this type of penetration into our facility, our space. Fairly simple. Uh, and then the second uh, portion of the impact section uh, is which specific national preparedness goal core capabilities does this investment work to achieve? And we referred to this earlier in the presentation where we had suggested a couple of the um, priorities that you might want to align to. Uh, this is, FEMA aligns all of their spending to these core capabilities, and that's just kind of more for FEMA than it is for you or for us. Uh, I would just suggest, uh, you know, restate what the, um, uh, your project uh, impact is in uh, short form uh, and explain which of those national priorities uh, it supports. If it supports more than one, you can list more than one. Uh, it's just we can't have this section be blank, otherwise you'll lose points on that score. And again, the typical uh, core capabilities for most of our projects would be screening, search, and detection would be one access control and identity verification, uh, physical protective measures, or threat and hazard identification, or planning, for instance. So, for instance, if we talked before about bollards in the uh, driveway of your facility, that would be a physical protective measure. If you're going to in, uh, install locking mechanisms on front doors, that could be access control. Search screening and detection could be uh, any number of things that are uh, implemented, like even access co access control card readers can dovetail into search screening and uh, detection. So, again, consult the four or five things that normally correspond with nonprofit projects. And again, this section is only for one point, but again, that one point could make a difference. And regarding funding history, if you have never received a nonprofit grant in the past, please make sure you complete this section and do not leave it blank. If the answer is no, then you are able to get a five-point bonus for no prior nonprofit grants. And for um, our scoring, that can make a tremendous difference in whether you are selected for a grant or not. Just so that you also have some information about our projects in the past, since 2005, we have awarded 308 subawards and over $26 million. So that five points can help you become one of the next round of subrecipients. 
Yes, uh, and I think that a couple of closing points on the investment justification itself. Um, uh, please, uh, please do review the scoring criteria. Uh, we have sent it around along with the application information itself, uh, but I think it's very useful for you to read, read the scoring criteria as you're answering the questions so you can make sure you're hitting those points uh, clearly. Uh, also, uh, as you see at the very bottom of this uh, investment justification, they do ask for contact information. Uh, and this is the person who, once this uh, investment is submitted, uh, if we have any questions about it, uh, if there's an error that we can catch before the due date that we can uh, flag, we'll reach back out to the person on this, uh, uh, this whose name and uh, email address is listed on this form. Um, this is also who uh, FEMA might reach out to if they do a monitoring visit. Uh, so try to make sure that the, you put in a, that name, that point of contact, the person that you want to receive follow-up information about this particular application. And please make sure that you have the authority of your church, your synagogue, your organization to complete these investment justifications on their behalf. And also, this is the document when we refer to the need for uh, multiple uh, applications. If you're going to apply for more than one site, you must provide an investment justification for every site that you occupy for which you are seeking funding. So this is the document that you would have to replicate for each site, but you'd make it specific to that particular site. I think that we might have some questions. If there's nothing more that you have to add, Charles? Um, yeah, I think we've reached the end of the materials we wanted to present. Uh, again, the, uh, the slides can be uh, sent out to anybody who needs them. We will post this presentation on the, the HCMA website as well, so you should have access to it there. Uh, the application materials, the, uh, the grant NOFO, the investment justification template, the scoring criteria, uh, and a, um, a redacted version of the preparedness uh, guidebook that is specifically about NSGP allowable costs is up on the HCMA website now. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and we will uh, endeavor to make it available on the HCMA website as soon as possible. Um, the, and just to make sure we say it one last time, we do need three items from every applicant. Your investment justification on the form uh, and saved correctly, the mission statement, and the vulnerability and risk assessment that your application is based on. Please make sure that we can get those three clearly when you submit your application. Uh, and the applications will be due to us by April 23rd, uh, by before midnight on April 23rd. But I do not suggest waiting until 11.59.59. I suggest trying to get that in earlier on the 23rd than later. There tends to be a flood at around 11.59.59. Um, I noticed one question earlier about what triggers EHP review. Basically, the installation of any equipment triggers the uh, EHP review process because the whole point is to make sure that the installation of equipment does not in any way uh, detrimentally affect the integrity of historic properties or even the environment through ground disturbance. So every project that involves the installation of equipment will require EHP review. The only ones that don't require EHP review are those such as uh, the portable handheld um, radios would not, uh, classroom-based training with uh, absolutely no type of equipment being used. Uh, it's, it really is called classroom-based training and uh, contract security personnel or planning. Those activities would not require EHP review, and there are appropriate boxes that indicate exemptions. Uh, we did have a question about the, uh, the scoring, uh, and I did respond in the chat, but just for the people on the call, uh, 40 points is the maximum score uh, that a perfect application would achieve. Um, the scoring process is basically the DC HCMA grant staff will do a, a initial scoring of your applications that we receive by the 23rd of April. We, that's uh, what we will do between the 23rd and the 14th of May. Uh, we will then submit to FEMA a, a consolidated application that includes all of the applications we've received that are complete and eligible, uh, and we will indicate what our scores are for those applications. Uh, hopefully you all get 40s. Um, 
then FEMA will take that, they will do their own scoring, and they have uh, several different uh, scores that they apply to it, again, using the same 40-point scale, and then they will make the final funding determination and publish the results in July. Uh, so a perfect application stands the best chance of being funded. Uh, of course, FEMA is the final de determiner, uh, so there's no guarantee that every app, even a, a perfect application will be funded. That's in FEMA's hands. Uh, but you want to get as high a score as you possibly can. Uh, I would say that if you are below 20 points, they're very unlikely to be funded. Uh, so try to do your best to answer each question completely. I see a question about um, delays caused by COVID or EHP reviews. Um, again, you know, EHP review can take as long as eight months. We have had some delays in EHP reviews for a number of regional reasons. Uh, some of the regional staff is deployed on coronavirus vaccine deployment. So one thing you might consider, the way that that factors in, is just having longer milestones, later milestones for, for instance, instead of having milestones in January or March or February, you might put those back to June, July, or August. But it should not impact the completion of your project generally within the first two years of the period of performance. You might not get it done in the first six months like you had hoped, and even uh, the first year. But again, this is a two-year project, and it can be a three-year project. Yeah, on that last point, I did uh, get a question in the chat about the period of performance. Uh, yes, it, the grant as a whole is 36 months, uh, and at the end of that 36 months, it closes, and that's a hard close, uh, meaning that we will run out of the ability to pay out reimbursements. Uh, so we encourage, and we will start off as, as a state, issuing two-year subawards to successful applicants with the intent being that we really want everybody to get out of the gate fast and get their EHP in get their projects approved, and get their projects completed as quickly as possible um, to address your threats. Uh, we are, the third year is there. We can use it if we absolutely have to, but it's, it's a fairly uh, dangerous area to get into uh, because if you run out of time, you might be left with a half-finished project and no ability to get paid for it because the federal period has ended. We really want to avoid that. We're trying to protect you from ever running out of time. But yes, if you absolutely need it and there's a, a justification, we can go into the third year of the grant uh, with the subaward. Um. We have asked FEMA, I do see this question about a nonprofit that is appearing in more than one region, more than one urban area, and whether you can just submit three for each region. I'm not sure that we are in the best position to answer the overall national policy. Yeah, I think that we only have visibility of the applications we receive in the national capital region. Uh, so if, that, if you wanted to ask that question, I could get that up to our FEMA program analyst. Um, but I will say this, uh, uh, we'll only count up to the number that we receive from the national capital region. Uh, and I don't think we'll be in a position to reject anybody's application as long as you're not submitting more than three in this area. Um, on other states, uh, again, if your organization has branches in other states, uh, if you're not within the national capital region, if those branches are elsewhere, either outside of Montgomery and Prince George's County in Maryland or outside of uh, Loudoun, Prince William, Alexandria, Arlington, and Fairfax in Virginia, if you're in Stafford in Virginia or if you have a branch in New York City, I would suggest those Entities should certainly uh, go get in contact with their state administrative agent uh, in their state to figure out what their process is going to look like and what their timeline is going to look like. And just because we're asking for our applications to be due on the 23rd of April does not mean that New York or Pennsylvania or any other region has the same deadline because we all have the authority to establish what deadline is best for our particular region. So for instance, if you have two sites that are located in Pennsylvania, you have to call or contact and email that emergency management agency within whose jurisdiction those two sites are within. So I'm not sure that we have any other questions. Hopefully we've... Uh, we did have one at the very beginning, and I just wanted to catch it really quickly before we wrap up, uh, and that is we had an early question about an incomplete uh, project, maybe a project that had already been started but not finished. Uh, that, there isn't any reason that wouldn't be eligible for nonprofit security grant funding. 
also previous applicants can apply again. There's no reason you can't do that. Um, it might, you might want to explain if your vulnerability assessment address like identifies you know, 10 gaps and you've already closed five of them and your new application is to close the remaining five, you could potentially address that in your narrative in your vulnerability section. You could say, like, we had 10 gaps, we've already closed five, this application is to close the remaining five, and that's why the project is only for five. But uh, so I, th there's, I think definitely proceed, uh, and if you feel like you need to provide more context, do it in your application. But remember, this application is going to be scored not only by us, but also by FEMA, and I'm not sure that anyone is going to reference any prior application to check to see the completion level of the prior application or project. Yeah, I think, keep in mind, just as somebody indicated, that the, one of our goals is always to not confuse FEMA. Uh, <laughs> so uh, tr try to keep it simple for them. Uh, we are at uh, our one hour mark. Um, I know we went fairly quickly. Uh, I, we had a lot to get through, uh, and we will make these materials available uh, on our website. Um, I think we have addressed the questions that we've received in the chat. If we didn't, uh, uh, then please send a follow-up email to, uh, to Sembri or myself, and we'll uh, get you a response. Uh, we do have uh, almost a, just a little over a full month before our deadline of April 23rd, so if you do have any questions or challenges, the earlier you identify those, the, the sooner we can make sure you get the information you need to be successful in your application. And please remember, again, although the mission statement and the vulnerability assessment are both necessary for completion of an application, neither of those documents are scored. So they do not need to be dissertations. They do not need to be 20-page long documents. They could even in fact be quite brief, so please keep that in mind. And don't let the need to create those documents deter you from applying from the, for this application. Well, if there are not any more questions. Uh, and uh, just for, I know we had a couple of entities that had indicated an interest in other uh, of facilities in other states. I did post in the chat the FEMA's listing of state administrative agencies. Uh, so if you do have a location in another state, uh, you can either follow that link or just Google FEMA state administrative agency. Uh, the first hit should be a list that FEMA maintains. It hopefully is up to date, uh, but if you're in Arizona, you'd definitely be dealing with the Arizona state administrative agency. And this uh, presentation is going to be recorded and hopefully uh, soon it will be on the HSEMA website. So keep checking our website on a regular basis, and hopefully by the conclusion of March, the uh, webinar will be available. And I will make an effort once it is available to make sure that everyone uh, who got an email for this today will get an email with the link, the information for viewing the recording. Okay, uh, thank you very much for joining. Um, I hope this is useful, and we'll uh, continue to support you through this application process. Good luck.